Hello Internet, I'm your only mate, and we have ourselves a new episode of Ruby to talk about today. Uh, this is Ruby Volume 9, Chapter 2, Altercation at the Auspicious Auction. I don't know why I should be more impressed by the fact that that's a long title, or that they kept it alliterative. Maybe both, probably. But of course, before I start talking about this episode, I would like to remind everybody that uh, you can watch this show along with me on uh, Crunchyroll, and there are many other legal ways to enjoy Ruby, like you can watch it on Crunchyroll.com, there's still stuff on YouTube, Roosterteeth.com, uh, you've got all kinds of manga and comic books that you can enjoy, you got video games, you got a board game, you don't really have an excuse anymore to not enjoy this show legally. Unless you just want to be a dick. So yeah, don't be a dick. Support shows you like legally. And the other thing I want to talk about before I start talking about this episode, uh, I mentioned a theory that came about because of the girls being exhausted by a few things and how they might not have aura. Well, I would like to point out a shot from the trailer of this volume where Neo uses her semblance to turn into Ruby, so that theory is BS. The girls should still have their aura, their semblances, so we can look forward to seeing those in action. And to answer the question as to why they haven't used them so far, I feel like I want to remind everybody that Volume 8, um, they were fighting non-stop for over a day with, like, no sleep, and I think they're still going with very little rest, so the girls are probably exhausted. I remember, Volume 8 was... Right after Volume 7. They have had no rest for a while. So something to keep in mind. Anyway, so the episode starts right from where we left off with all the girls just checking out the view of the Ever After. They respond to Blake's whole thing about them being in a fairy tale. Ruby doesn't really believe that. And I love that Blake doesn't even say anything. She just points to Lissel. <laughs> of course, Weiss tries to use logic by saying, We fell from the sky. Ruby made friends with a talking mouse, and I love that Little just screams friend. Little's cute, okay. She and Blake got caught by killer vines, and Yang's arm got stolen by a talking raccoon driving a wagon full of trash. And Weiss... Yeah, she's just losing her mind at all of this and how ridiculous it all sounds. But it's about to get even worse for her because Blake actually knows where they are. Referencing the story, The Girl Who Fell Through the World, and actually mentions that they are in the Ever After. Blake put in that book knowledge to good use, all the more reason I think when Ruby, like, snaps, uh, because we know that's probably coming, I think Blake should take over as acting leader for a little bit. Weiss has doubts about this, and I have to ask, Weiss, is that really that out of the question? I mean, because for our Ruby, wait, there have been fairy tales and stories that have turned out to be actual things. Like, the four maidens, and we know the maidens exist. The girl in the tower, which is Salem. The man with two souls. I mean, that's Ozpin. So, realizing that they're in a book, I mean, kind of, Blake knows pretty much exactly what they have to do to get out. Of course, first thing is finding Yang's arm, which is actually part of the story, finding the talking raccoon. Fortunately, Lissel knows about a talking raccoon, and they volunteer to lead the way. We get another smash cut of Lissel falling asleep. Which, I have to admit, I did find that funny, but... I'm hoping this doesn't become, like, too much of a trend. But given events that we are going to be talking about in just a little bit, I don't think we're going to be getting any more of, uh, Lissel saying they'll lead the way, smash cuts on him falling asleep. So while Lissel is taking a snooze, the girls walk forward towards where the town is, and... Lissel does give some info about, uh, the raccoon. About how they stopped by Lissel's village before going into town. And when Yang asks about if they steal stuff from the Mises too, Lissel says, just the things we're not looking at. Fair is fair. I'm going to be calling back to that when we get to the particular scene. Weiss asks Yang how the raccoon even got her arm in the first place. And when Yang explains, they do something that I always love in Ruby. Whenever there's like a flashback or something going on, they always draw it in a different art style. And it's just really... It, I, it's just something I love about it, okay? 
Yang states that she was knocked out, and when she woke up, the raccoon had already stolen her arm. And Blake does something that... Okay. 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 So. For a long time, I've really wanted to see Blake just make a pun in this show. I always thought, oh, that could be cute, and there could be, like, a back and forth between her and Yang in particular. And for those who are familiar with my other content, like the What Ifs, for example, when I did uh, What If Blake Lost an Arm Instead, while she was staying at uh, Tai and Yang's place, you know, having, you know, spent more time there, lets a pun slip out, and there's a little back and forth there. I I thought that was cute. Also, in my fan fiction, Be Family, which is about these two with a kill on the way, I slip one in there as well. And I love this scene so much for so many reasons. I won't lie, when I was watching this scene, I reacted like this. They say he caught you an arm. <laughs> How disarming. Oh. About time. Actually, not only does Blake make a pun, she makes two. And when it cuts away to Weiss and Ruby, it's hard to hear, but she actually makes two more. Those are, and I quote, I guess we'll have to catch the thief yellow-handed. And, and I quote, how fitting for a cash grabber. So not only does Blake make a pun in this scene, but she's already made more puns than Yang throughout the entire show. And when I say that, I mean specifically the volumes. Because f from volumes like 1 to 9, Yang's only made 2. I would have thought it'd be more, but yeah, no, it's 2. So in this one scene alone, Blake has doubled the amount of puns, and you know what? I say she gets the title of Pun Queen in Ruby. And you know what that earns? Blake's the new Pun Queen! More like Blake Punadonna. I like that one. And speaking of what I like, just this whole interaction between Blake and Yang, it's... Okay, so I talked in the last episode about how, like, cute those two were when they reunited, but this freaking moment... <laughs> like, the... The puns that Blake makes to, uh, like, you know, have a little laugh with Yang, the way they, like, playfully shove each other, the way... The way that Blake has her hands behind her back, like, she's a flirty schoolgirl or something. <laughs> the grin that Blake has. <laughs> And, oh my god, the way that, like, it, they clearly want to, like, hold hands, but they're just, like... There's no way these two aren't becoming a couple by the end of the volume, right? Like, it's, it's gotta happen. I mean, they're basically a couple in every other way, aside from, you know, kissing and flower calling each other girlfriends. So, like... Come on, man. And it's also made me realize watching this volume and being a bee shipper, we ask Kruby for crumbs, they decide to just give us entire loaves of bread each episode. Really good volume to ship these two, apparently. I'm all for it. And speaking of things I'm all for, when it cuts to Weiss and Ruby, Weiss says about time. Now, for those who have watched mine and Max's Ruby discussions, we always have this like, idea that basically these two just know, uh, have known for a while that Blake and Yang like, eventually becoming a couple is pretty much inevitable. And they're just like, are they, are they just going to get on with it? Like, they, come on. So this scene right here, it just means that we were right on the money. <laughs> and I love that so much. I think this calls for... Why speak So that makes me all kinds of happy and I cannot wait to talk to Max about this moment because we haven't recorded it yet. However, it's time for some more tonal whiplash because after all that cute sort of stuff, Ruby and Y start talking about Atlas. Y stating that it's all gone and she has nothing left to go back to and it being just like Beacon again. And just hoping that Jean and Winter made it out, and despite them doing everything that they could, it wasn't enough because they couldn't save Atlas. While it's great to be a bee shepherd, this volume also just... right in the fields. 
Although what makes that worse is, um, yeah, um, Weiss tells Ruby, look, Penny, I know that was a lot to hear, and yeah, they just kind of leave it there, and given the pause that Weiss has afterwards, I am not looking forward to the moment when Ruby finds out exactly what happened and the wife hasn't told her. But after that, the gang come to a bridge, which... I would not want to cross that. Like, okay, okay, the stone structure part with the red carpet, like, okay, that's fine. The wood part? Hell no. Unless I was walking right in the center, there was no one alongside me. And... Yeah, no, I would not want to cross that bridge. Hell no. That does not look safe. Anyway, this bridge is when Team Ruby find out that not only does Lissel not know, like, what's on the other side, due to never being this far from home, but also doesn't really have a clue on how to get back and just does not know where anything is anymore. They respond with these expressions and... So many moots. I may be biased, but... Blake's just is the cutest. So whilst they're doing that, Lissel decides to embody their favourite Minecraft Let's Player by giving up and building a house. If anyone understands that reference, please let me know in the comments. Also, in the scene when they're building a house, Lissel has like a little dance and sings a little song. Like, Vice asks Lissel if they'd like to come with Team Ruby, the house collapses, and... Lissel's staying with the group. Okay, when Team Ruby get back to Remnant, can they just take Lissel with them? Please. <laughs> like, can that, can that be a thing? So, yeah, uh, my view on, like, potential fates for Lissel, uh... The one I'm the most down for is going back to Remnant with Team Ruby. Like, can we, can we just keep Lissel, please? And about the middle ground... Emotional goodbye when Team Ruby go back. It'd be sad to see that, but you know what? I could see it making for a good moment, and it could be cute. You know, as much as I'd like them to go back to Remnant with Team Ruby, like... That, that'd be okay. Uh, the very bottom I do not want to see this is something awful happening to Little and they die. Like, no, let's not have that. I'm looking at you, Kruby. Don't hurt the meese. Specifically this one. Anyway, Team Ruby get to town, and all the people look like pieces from a board game. Fitting, considering what they're going to be doing soon. They find the wagon belonging to the raccoon that stole Yang's arm, which is named Jinxie, by the way. Yang wants to rough them up and just take her arm back. But considering there's guards and they'd make a scene, Blake advises, hey, let's bargain with Jinxie just like Alex said in the book. Yang would rather hit them. And you know what? I don't blame her. Jinxie unveils three items that are up for auction, none of which look like Yang's arm. Well, I mean, one of them does have some obvious tells, but yeah. And after Yang calls this out, Blake mentions that all of Jinxie's items are just other things disguised. So people will think they're getting something nice when it's actually just trash. So whilst the three try to figure out which one is Yang's arm, Blake notices Ruby staring at one of them. For some reason, the jade-colored doll. She's drawn to it. Oh boy. Jinxie auctions up the first item, so hey, we get to see how this operates. They sell a rabbit doll for a hug. And we find out from Lissell that hugs are actually really valuable here. I think we could all learn a thing from this world. And you know what, as someone who works in retail, I would appreciate it a lot if people paid for things with hugs, okay? That's a good thing this world didn't have to go through the 2020 we all went through. Jinxie auctions up the second item. Both Yang and one of the toy soldiers bid for it at the same time. And I am honestly kind of distracted by the fact that this guy is Nick Kramer. Like, I recognized his voice immediately, but I was just thinking to myself, Oh, I... I know that voice! Like, where do I know that person from? Ugh. Drove me a little insane. But yeah, love Nick Kramer, so, was so happy to hear him in Ruby. Anyway, Jinxie names their price, 
And it's knowing what it's like to feel loved, which makes Yang back down. So yeah, Yang's arm is lost. Anyway, there's one item left and Ruby wants it. Jinxie names the price for the jade colored doll, enough hope to fill that jar. And I want to point out the detail that it looks like the doll is being magnified and just borderline in the jar. While talking about hope that Ruby has left and uh, yeah, um, oh boy, that's, uh, that hurts. So whilst that's going on, Little decides to put Jinxie's own logic to the test and just take the doll while they're not looking. <laughs> I, I love that that's just what Little does. It's fantastic. <laughs> Jinxie gets angry because no one's supposed to touch it until the deal is done, and because of that, the doll turns back into what it was originally, which is one of Penny's swords. Oh boy. I'll get to the, the emotional part of this in a bit, but the scepter turns back into Yang's arm, and the rabbit turns into a mouse. I have questions! So, Lissell said that Jinxie just takes what they're not looking at. Does that mean Jinxie just kidnaps Lissell's kind? And just sells them off as other stuff? Like... Oh god. That gets a lot more morbid when you really think about it. Now, you know what? Kinda hope we never see Jinxie again. Just... Yang struggles for her arm back, and I want to point out the detail, when she shoots the guard, it looks like she's just wielding a sidearm, <laughs> like full-on western style. I love that, that is amazing. And Ruby picks up Penny's sword and starts to cry a little bit, oh boy, Ruby. And it hurts even more when you remember what Ruby said in the very second episode of this show, how weapons are an extension of ourselves, they're a part of us. So she's holding a part of Penny. And now I'm thinking even more morbidly, uh, because I'm realizing if one of Penny's swords, uh, fell, that could mean that Penny's body is around. I dread to think what could have happened. So anyway, now that I've uh, scared myself in so many ways, we get something funny. Yang runs off so happy with her arm, Blake understandably frazzled by everything, and I love that Weiss is just strolling along. So yeah, the girl leaves, and Jinxie has to repay that person with a hug. Hugs are nice. The girls escape to a clearing, and Yang comments about how they take auctions really seriously. I won't lie, this just makes me wonder how things would go down on eBay if there was just like a live chat sort of thing. People were just like bidding on stuff but adding comments. I don't know whether I want that or not. So with that thought in your head now, Yang holds up her prosthetic and requests high five from Blake and Weiss who leave her hanging. Leave her Yang in. Blake is frustrated on how they're doing things exactly how Alex did. And Ruby can't explain why, but she was drawn to it. <sighs> this volume is going to hurt me. And because Ruby is sad, it starts raining on just them. Weiss has had enough of it and suggests they just go straight to the tree. Blake protests by saying, but in the book, Weiss is having none of it though and suggests they go straight to the tree because they know how the story ends. I won't lie, this is making me picture Weiss playing Persona 4 and then starting New Game Plus and just wanting to accuse the murderer right away before going through like any of the rest of the story because she knows how it ends. And we get the whole loop thing again, but this time with Weiss and not Ruby and oh my god, it is hilarious. <laughs> Weiss just getting so frustrated with the whole thing and just picking up a rock, throwing it and just hitting herself in the head with it. <laughs> Weiss has just been fantastic this episode, okay? I mean, she's one of the best girls. She's fantastic in every episode. Come on. The girls hear the knights coming after them. 
Ruby asks Blake what Alex did next, and Blake says that she defeated the Red King at his own game. The knights show up to arrest them, and Ruby says they want to go to the castle. Well, specifically the birthday party. Which is the knight's plan, they are taking them there. As prisoners. Yeah, this is because Yang took her arm back after they had bought it and it's declared royal property. And then we get a moment that... <sighs> what do I say about this? Ruby offers them Penny's sword, saying that it's the weapon of a powerful warrior, the most powerful to have lived, who was touched by magic, gave her life for thousands, took a message of hope to the stars, and could see the world through better eyes. Like, oh my god. And this scene, I need to shout out Lindsay Jones, Casey Williams, and Martin Gonzalez. Because this moment, like... I actually came this close to just tearing up when I was watching it. Like, every time I watch it, okay? Like, it... This is probably one of, like... It's up there for me as, like, one of the saddest moments of the whole show, and it's done so beautifully. Like... Seriously, like, Lindsay, Casey, Martin, like, or just anyone from Kruby, if you are watching this, like... You do such a fantastic job, and I want you to know that I appreciate you. So, the knights take Penny's sword, they take Team Ruby to the castle, and that's the end of the episode. What did you all think? I bloody loved it. Like, this episode and the first one, like, just for, off of these two alone, I think we're in for a fantastic volume. And I am all about it. Like, as much as I do say I can't, I get hurt by all the, like, emotional scenes, like, they're done so fantastically. And... Like, they're so well made, and I think the fact that they do hurt me to watch just shows that Kruby are doing a great job. Uh, just with how funny, like, Weiss and Blake have been, I mean, they are the best girls, so, like, come on. And also just, like, how adorable, just, like, Blake and Yang are, <laughs> like... I, I cannot wait for the next episode. I really can't. And there's so much that I skipped over, like, in this video. All the tiny details, like, all the animation on Blake's ears, like, all the stuff with Weiss whenever she's, like, freaking out in the background, or just, like, all the details on the facial expressions, all the moving characters on screen at once, like, all the environments, uh, characters that they would have had to build, like, from the ground up, specifically for this volume, all the backgrounds, just, like... Everyone in Kruby, like, love you for this. Love you for this volume. I mean, I love you for just, like, the show in general. And I just want that, I just want that out there. You make a fantastic show, and I just, I want to keep watching it. So yeah, let me know what you thought of this episode in the comments. Uh, and what your predictions are for the next episode. Is there anything that perhaps is on your wish list that maybe I can hit the gong over? Yeah, let me know in the comments. I am going to wrap this video up. So, thanks for watching all of that stuff and considering Ruby was last week. For this week, here is my Weiss outro. Bye. Thank you for watching Your Only Mate. Tune in next time. And this is when the girls find out that not only does Lissel not know, like, what's on the other side. My iPad fell over.